So I'm Karen McRae and I'm just doing a bit of work with the Kyle and Loch Elsh Community Trust through the Loch Elsh Community Response. So um, I will hand you over to Robin who will do a wee introduction. Okay, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining um, this class today. I hope that I can inspire you and help you in your um, veg patch. I'm just going to see if I can get off. Yeah, I just want to go back to gallery view. That's nicer. So I can see all your faces. Um, so I live in the Scottish Highlands um, on my family's croft. And I have, so we're halfway up a mountain, um, which means that the season starts about two weeks later here and is also shorter. So when stuff is already starting to grow down in Dorney, I know in about two weeks time, things will start, that those same plants will start to grow and flower up here. Um, in my garden, in fact, Karen, maybe do you just want to go through like quite slowly or, or maybe for like three seconds each the, the pictures just to show what my garden looks like. So over the last four years, I've built the garden up from like one raised bed to I've now got five raised beds um, and two other small plots. And I've got a patch of rhubarb and um, a big patch of raspberries and various fruit um, bushes and a wee herb garden as well. So right now it's all looking quite neat and tidy as the plants are quite small. That's my compost, um, my two compost bins. So one is in use and one is um, breaking down. So in a few months that's just going to be like a mental jungle. It looks quite ordered now but I can just say here you can see the um, tires in the foreground. So I've got courgette plants in there and I plant them in tires because um, the black attracts the sun and it makes them, the soil warm so things grow really well. Obviously there's a question of whether little bits of rubber will find their way into your plants or the chemicals from them. I'm not sure about that but I, I do find it quite handy to grow stuff in there and also parsley and herbs grow well in tires. Okay and I've got, um, just if you go to go back one, just to say I've got garlic growing there but I've put um, some straw down to try and stop the weeds. So obviously you get a lot of weeds going through. So I've used straw as mulch. I read about that online. And that's some fruit bushes. Cool, okay. So I think that gives a nice overview of the garden so you guys can get a feel of, of what it's like. Um, I just wanted to start by, I don't know what kind of gardens you guys have access to, whether you do have um, a small garden or a patio or a bit more land, but there are so many different ways that you can plant. You can plant in pots, you can even plant carrots in pots actually. Um, you can get grow bags to plant tomatoes in, um, you can have raised beds or you can do no dig beds, which is what um, Jake and Kate covered last week. I don't know if, if some of you joined for that. Um, but when I watched them talk about their no dig method, I thought, mm, okay, if I did my garden again, I might, I would probably do the no dig method. Um, I chose to do raised beds. Um, you can also get fish boxes, um, these nice big uh, fish boxes to use. I've got one just outside my cabin where I have parsley, so I don't have to walk all the way down to the garden. Um, and you can also use a polytunnel or you can make terraces. If you've got a hillside, you can make terraces into the hill. Um, and so I made a little video of different places you can plant. And maybe this is a good time to show that just to inspire you um, how you can use space. I want to show you my mum's garden because she has quite a few um, pots here and fish pots at the end. But she's also got um, a bit of garden going on on the hillside up here. But as well as that, she's got like uh, cut and come again lettuce and parsley and um, more lettuce and some herbs going on along here. Um, and her neighbour, if you come and have a look over the fence. So 
the mum's neighbour has got has built um, a raised bed on the back of the house and they've got carrots and some very lovely healthy looking potatoes. Around the other side of his house he's built another um, really good sized raised bed and um, he's used um, plastic piping to create a crane to put mesh over which I guess to keep um, birds but probably cats out as well um, and he's used the plastic um, piping whereas I used uh, willow up at my place but this is really good and sturdy. I also wanted to show you my neighbour's um, garden, one of my neighbour's gardens. He's actually built um, like a terrace back against the hill. I just think it's fantastic. He's built up the edges with um, clods of earth and then filled in the back. And so he's got, growing along the front here, he's got like this amazing healthy rocket plant that comes back every year. There's herbs, he's got a big um, line of black currants. And then down here, he's got another little herb garden with some thyme and more rocket. Um, chives and all that going on and then at the back here he's got another terrace lovely grassy wall he's got beans growing at the back um, chives a circle of lettuce and some brassicas I'm not sure what they are maybe some kale some flowers and a beautiful beautiful big healthy massive sage plant he's still got his kale from last year which he's still able to eat it's flowering and got some leaves here and some raspberries and he's fertilized it all with seaweed. All right so that was just to show you that you can do a lot with different kinds of spaces um, and so once you've decided how, how you're going to use your space or, or whether you're going to use pots or no dig uh, beds or raised beds um, or terraces you're going to need some soil and some compost um, and Plants are quite hungry little things, so they do use quite a lot of nutrients in the soil. Um, and there, you can buy, you can buy um, manure and fertilizer and compost and soil, but you can also make so much yourself if you have the resources. Um, and I'm going to share with you some quite easy things to do. Um, obviously, you can have uh, compost heaps, and you can just use what comes out the waste out of your own house. Um, or if you've got access to cows or horses or chickens, you can use their manure, any grass clippings. Um, you can also collect seaweed. I use seaweed on my uh, raspberries and in my compost. Um, and you can make a tea from it as well. And you can also make fertilizers from um, manure, from seaweed. Um, and from leaves like nettles or comfrey because they're, they've got an amazing properties in their leaves. Um, so once you've got your soil, every year it's a, it's a good idea to bulk it up with fertiliser. Um, and at the end of each year in the winter, it's good to put fertiliser down and cover it with cardboard. And then again in the spring. Um, so maybe now is a good time, Karen, to show the fertiliser video. So it's really great to make some fertilizer if you can um, because that really helps bring your seedlings on. Um, I make fertilizer out of nettles, um, comfrey, hen manure because I've got hens and seaweed. So in here I've got hen manure and in this one is seaweed and then down in the garden I've got the nettle and the comfrey one. Um, it's a, it can be a bit stinky but it's, it's really worth it and I have done a few tests where I've watered some seedlings with the fertilizer and then some haven't had it and I can tell the difference. Um, so with the hen manure one you just put like the manure into a dishcloth or a pillowcase and weigh it down with a stone and put it in a bucket of water for about a week, stir it every day and have the bucket um, in, in a sunny position. Um, and then after that you dilute it and you just, so this is undiluted, it's quite dark. Um, you would probably want to dilute that until it looks like weak tea. If you do it too strong, you can burn your um, seedlings, which I've also done. So I would probably do that, or maybe even I might even go a bit weaker. Um, because I would rather, through trial and error, I would rather 
have it weaker and fertilise my plants a bit than too strong and burn them. That looks pretty good actually. I would say that's quite safe. Um, and then this one here is full of uh, seaweed which I haven't actually used yet so it's looking pretty rank and um, pretty mouldy. Um, not mouldy sorry but like got something some film growing in it but I'm sure that's going to make great fertiliser. So this is the comfrey. Um, comfrey is really easy to grow and the reason I've got it in here is it spreads like crazy so it's quite good to contain it otherwise you'll end up with comfrey everywhere. The bees absolutely love it, I can hear them buzzing away right now. Um, and the leaves make great fertiliser. So I just collected a whole load of leaves and then put them into this plastic container here. Um, I probably filled it like half full of leaves and then topped it up with water um, and then if you want to have a look in here there's a nice goopy black stinking liquid in there but again if you dilute that down the same way that I did with the chicken um, manure tea it makes an amazing fertilizer. I feel like I should also just say that Rob, Robin is a um, film maker by trade as well, which is why her her videos are, are brilliant. They're really well put together. Robin, thank you for doing that, for doing them. Okay, anyway. no worries. And um, just to say that um, you would make nettle tea the same way that you make comfrey tea, and I'm pretty sure everyone must have nettles not too far from their houses. Yeah. So put them to good use. Um, and they are actually full of, they're high in nitrogen um, and my mum was just asking me today what she could use, her, her, she said her beans were looking a little bit yellow and she found out that that was a lack of nitrogen. So I, I looked it up online and found out that nettles were high in nitrogen so she's going to make a quick tea which you can do apparently by adding boiling water and letting them steep for an hour. So that would maybe not be as strong as when you leave it for a month but it would be a quick, might be a quick fix. Um, so, does anyone have any questions about fertiliser while we're on it? Can, when you make nettle tea, can you include the stalks or just the leaves? Yeah, no, everything. Even the roots would be fine. Just put rubber gloves on and a long sleeve jumper that's not a woolly one so there's no holes in it and just cut it off and stick it in. I just got a quick question, Robin. Yeah. Um, the the comfrey did did you plant that or did you find it was kind of growing wild anyway, and then you've sort of think, boxed it off? Um. No, it was planted in there. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if it grows wild up here. I'm not sure myself. But definitely yeah. down south. Um. We've got another question just coming in here from Sue. Um. Should you break down the leaves for the fertilizer? No. Just literally just stick them into a bucket or any kind of container and then fill it with water and leave them for a month but you could I think you would probably be okay to use it after a couple of weeks or use the boiling water method if you need it really quickly and then even once you've um, used all the fertilizer which I never actually have I would put the leaves at the end of the year, even if they've been there for six months, or in fact I've even done it with leaves that have been there the next year, and then just put them on as mulch around fruit bushes. So n never put anything to waste, or you could put it in your compost heap. Does seaweed need cleaned with fresh water to get rid of the salt? Really good question. Yes, it definitely does. So you can just lay it in the yard and hose it down or just leave it for a couple of days and let the rain do the job. And then some, someone's also adding there, Robin, sorry, the, the seaweed, um, do you, you just soak that as the same with the nettles and the, and the comfrey? Uh, yep, but the, the seaweed one that I made, um, I just soaked that for a week and I made sure that it was in a sunny position so that the black bucket um, heated up a little bit. Um, can you tell us, more about the properties of seaweed for your plants. Um, I would just need to Google that. <laughs> I'm an amateur, really. I, I look so I use um, the internet a lot um, for resources. So yeah, if I would need to look online for that. 
Yeah, just to come in on that one, Robin, um, Jake and Kate cover, covered quite a lot about the seaweed as well. They gave about using seaweed is um, to try and use seaweed that doesn't have the bugs and things in it, the beasties. Um, so they collect their seaweed from near like a stream that's kind of the seaweed's being washed anyway um, mm. in the process of it. So. But that thing about the bugs is it's not because it, they would damage your plants but so that you're not taking the bugs from yes. the shore. But I have to say if I take stuff with bugs on it my hens love it. It's so true. It doesn't go, they don't go to waste but I don't do it all the time so I'm not taking loads and loads of bugs from the shore. Um, so when you do go to plant your seeds or your seedlings there's various ways that you can do that. Um, you can bring your seeds on inside so in a windowsill or you can plant them in a cold frame or a greenhouse or a polytunnel um, and then plant them, the seedlings out into the garden or you can plant seeds directly into the soil um, or you can create like a little nursery in your garden, plant the seeds in the nursery and then plant the um, seedlings into the main bed and it just depends on um, the time of year you're doing that at or what the plants are. So for instance carrots and um, beetroot are better off going straight into the soil and also um, parsnips, most root vegetables, are, are seeds are better off just going straight into the soil. Um, but things like beans and courgettes, I like to start them off a bit earlier so that you get a bit of a head start, especially here where the growing season is shorter. Or you can of course just buy seedlings um, from gardening shops and around here um, the two that are great to use or the, the two that I know of are Dunkraig Nursery and Loch Duh Plants. Um, so I made another little film um, to show you different ways of planting. This is my cold frame which is just an old trailer with um, an old caravan window on the top so you can use something like that or you can make any any of your own version my mum uses uh, this which she bought um, online I think and it's just plastic um, in a wooden frame and she also grows seedlings in her windowsill so that works quite well in here I have um, like little seed tray modules um, and that has spring onions in them and I have things like uh, coriander which probably doesn't grow quite as well outside and I'm still um, growing on some uh, tomato plants when planting in the cold frame I use all sorts of containers you can use anything like uh, old mushroom containers or you can cut the tops of um, drink cartons or I have a whole array of pots, different sizes, honestly just whatever you can, any kind of tray form, just use that. And then I have my seeds which I keep in a nice tin and I keep an old biscuit tin and I keep the tin um, in the shed in a cool place, you don't want your seeds to get warm. Um, one thing I have learned through trial and error is that always use um, potting compost like a multi-purpose potting compost or a um, seed potting compost because this year I ran out and I tried just using soil that I dug up from around the place and almost everything that I grew in that or all the seeds that I put in that um, just didn't grow and I don't know whether it was um, the time of year that I did it at or whether there just wasn't enough nutrients in the soil or also I might have overwatered because some of my beans grew with quite crinkly leaves um, and I learned from the Zoom um, grow cl class last week with Kate and Jake over the hill in Glenelg that you that crinkly leaves can be a sign of overwatering so I think I might have done that. So I didn't have so much luck this year with some of my seeds so I definitely recommend um, compost every time for that. These are some seedlings that I grew um, earlier in the year in the cold frame, some beans and some onions. Um, I haven't planted these beans yet because I run out of space so I don't know what to, where to put them. Um, but that's something I should have mentioned actually is that when you bring things on in a cold frame 
or especially if you grow them indoors in your windowsill and they're not used to the cold temperature of outside or the interchangeable temperature or also the wind so when you first bring them out um, their stems are quite delicate so you need to do what's called hardening off which is where you take them out for a couple of hours each day for about a week um, just to get them used to so that their um, stems strengthen up. Apparently you can also just like run your hand over them a couple of times indoors and that helps their, their stems to strengthen. This is my um, pea and bean frame and I think these these beans are um, these ones but you can see the difference of how much they've grown because they've had all the soil to spread their roots around it and take nutrients from whereas these have been contained in little pots. Um, so here I've got monge to different kinds of beans and peas as well um, and some of the peas that I planted really early in the year inside and then brought out are actually starting to flower. This is my roots bed so I've got parsnips, carrots and beetroot and so I'm going to show you how to plant carrot seeds and um, there's one line here that for some reason hasn't really grown so well I don't know why it's only got five carrots so I'm actually just going to rake over it and plant again um, so I'm just going to rake it to dislodge the weeds luckily the rake fits just in between the other two lines of carrots which is fine And then I'm going to mark out a straight line. So I'll just use a stick, run it through. And then that also creates like a a little trench. That's where I'm going to put the seeds. So I found the best way to control the amount of seeds that you put in is just to put some in the palm of your hand and then just take a wee pinch and sprinkle them as you move your hand along um, the trench that you've made. And then you just gently cover it over like that and just pat it down. And then after you've planted the seeds, just give them a wee water. Another way that you can plant is to create a nursery. And then once the seeds have grown and become little seedlings, then you can plant them into a bigger area. And that's what I've done with the kale this year. This is the first time I've ever tried a nursery um, because I love kale, so I plant quite a lot of it. And last year I just kind of tried to spread the seeds out in an entire bed um, rather than do it in rows. And then I had to thin them out afterwards. So I thought I would try a nursery this year. So now that these have grown into quite a decent size, I'm just going to dig them up and plant them into this area. This area has been um, fertilised with manure at the end of last year and I've raked it over a few times and weeded it but as you can see there's quite a lot of weeds again so before I plant all of these I will again weed it and give it a wee rake. You just dig them up. Like so. Taking care of the root system. like a nice healthy plant and then transplant it to its new home oh there's actually two there I'll just break that one off gently if I can okay um uh, just seeing a couple of questions come up here, so I'm just going to answer them. Um, someone's saying that there is a Facebook page called Sky Plant Share, um, where people can share their plants, and I'm guessing seedlings. That's a great idea. And then somebody's asking, um, do you use bot compost with slow release nutrients or just plain? Um, just whatever I can get, actually. Um, I got compost recently from Loch Dew Plants and I think he only had one kind of compost that was a multi-purpose one but I guess if I had the choice I would buy one especially for um, vegetables, for bringing on vegetables. 
but there was a there has been a, sh a shortage of compost this year and it's not just to do with the um, COVID virus it's also to do with uh, flooding um, last year so I know it's been quite difficult to get and I think that's why I thought oh I'll just try using the soil that I've got around here because I thought there's nettles growing out of it and I thought well nettles like good soil so this must be good but I don't know what happened just didn't wasn't just wasn't very successful so I will always try and use compost from now on. Um, okay so I guess you all want to know what's good to plant now. Um, I just to talk about what you can plant now I use a couple of different resources um, so there's a book here called um, Growing Your Own Vegetables and there's a whole chapter in it called um, The Seasonal Guide to Main Garden Jobs and it tells you goes through like midwinter, late winter, early spring, mid spring and it tells you the jobs that you can be doing but also what you could be planting um, so I find that really useful and also I have this calendar which has got by month and um, what you can sow, what you can plant and tend, what you can harvest. So I used that quite a lot in the beginning just to um, remind me to do stuff and make me think. But I don't I use it, I find that I use it less now um, that I'm getting more familiar with, with, with what I can do up here. And there's also a website, in fact, I, I can, could you please show that website? It is, and this is where I order my seeds from, it's called um, realseeds.co.uk and I really like this website because quite a few of their seeds are organic, they don't use any F1 hybrids and they quite often collect heirloom and old seeds and then they um, bring them on, so I know they have like Shetland, no not Shetland kale, sorry Sutherland kale, so they got seeds from um, an elderly woman up in Sutherland that had been, had been growing her kale for I don't know decades um, and and grew a whole load of her kale and harvest seeds from that and so yeah exactly they've got a really useful menu on the um, left hand side and if you keep going, yeah keep going down Karen so it tells you how to save your seeds but here in this more information menu it's got um, a monthly sowing calendar, it's got tips for beginners, um, so there's quite a lot there you can use and if you want to know what you can um, sow in the months coming up you can check it out there. Um, so the things that you can sow at the moment are still salads, so things like lettuce or um, chard, which is perpetual spinach, rocket, radish, kale, you could still get away with planting kale and in fact kale grows all winter and into the next year um, so that would be fine to plant just now. Brussels sprouts, you could still get away with planting them, carrots, beetroot, parsnips, turnips, courgette plants, cucumbers, spring onions and beans, still French and runner beans and if you don't have the seeds you can buy the seedlings already growing from nurseries so then you get a head start. Um, and once you've planted your seeds and your seedlings, of course, you have to take care of them, um, which means that you do need to get out there and do some weeding um, in between the midges. And it's incredible how quickly the weeds spring up if you just, if you don't go into your garden for a couple of days, um, weeds are already taking over. So there's a lot of weeding but I'm starting to learn more about mulching which is where you can cover the ground around your plants with things like grass clippings so if you have a big lawn that you that you cut regularly you're going to have lots of grass clippings they make great mulch unfortunately I don't cut much of the grass so I don't have that that many grass clippings um, to use seaweed is quite good although stuff will eventually grow up through it but seaweed is quite good to put around raspberries so that helps keep stuff down for a while straw so I put straw around um, strawberries for weeds um, and also I learned recently that I could put it around garlic um, and you can also grow I haven't done this yet but you can grow things like clover um, and it's called it's called uh, it's like when you oh it's called green manure that's right where you plant other plants like a blanket layer in between what you're growing and they will grow up and block out the weeds and then you can dig them up or cut them down and they will act as um, 
fertilizer um, in your ground. Um, and when you plant things like, if you're planting from seed, like you saw me do with the carrots, they're going to be, there's going to be little clumps of them together. So you need to thin them out. And it can be quite difficult to thin out because you think, oh, I don't want to um, kill that carrot because <laughs> you want it to grow. But actually, by having too many carrots together, you're stopping them growing. So you're just better off just being ruthless and getting rid of some of them. Um, and it's a good idea that you can just pinch them when they're small or cut them rather than pull them up because pulling them up dislodges the soil around. Um, watering. We do actually get some quite hot spells um, without rain, amazingly enough. We've had that quite a bit recently, so you will need to water. Although I read recently in two different sources that it's better to water heavily once a week than to water a bit each day. And I have up until now been watering a bit each day. And I think what I'm going to try now is just doing a heavy water where you really soak the soil to a reasonable depth rather than just doing it every morning or evening and only you know just wetting the, the very top part of the soil and here you shouldn't need to water at all say your fruit plants um, in the garden if they're well established they should be able to survive without watering of course if you've got pots that's different pots and things in the cold frame will dry out quite quickly so you'll need to take care of them um, and I thought I want to talk about a little bit about raspberries because um, I know a lot of people plant their raspberries in lovely straight rows and support them and then at the end of the year you cut all the dead canes off and um, I made a little video of my raspberry patch which is more like a jungle and I think it's just nice to show an alternative way of doing it. This is my raspberry jungle. I just wanted to chat a little bit about raspberries because um, there's quite a lot of questions about raspberries um, in last week's Zoom class with Kate and Jake. Um, so these raspberries, um, I inherited them when I moved back home. They were already here, but they haven't been really been planted in any kind of straight lines. Um, and also I don't, oh, there's always online, you always read about cutting um, back the old, um, stems at the end of the year so it's just a new growth but I've just left mine because the old growth helps support the new growth um, and I'm squelching around in disgusting seaweed at the moment um, I've piled on a big load of seaweed this year to help fertilise them um, and I've just got an oak tree so I'm going to have to replant that and there's mint growing over there and nettles but I've got quite a lot of the nettles out so it's not so much fun so yeah it's a raspberry jungle and they all seem to go great and um, my mum makes um, amazing raspberry jam um, which we feed to our EMBs so that's why it's so nice and we also eat lots of raspberries as well and the birds eat loads of raspberries too so yeah so there's always more than one way to do things and I've certainly found that um, when you look online and watch one video or, or see one thing there's somebody else saying something different so I guess what that taught me is it doesn't really matter it's still going to work you just got to find the way the best way for you and I guess like I still use um this is my um dad's book the good old reader's digest book um, and it's a really good resource like if you've got lots of kale like I do sometimes I look in here just to see what recipes they've got what things I can do with the kale um but in here, for instance, they tell you to plant garlic in the spring, so February, March, April, I think. But I plant my, last two years I planted my garlic late December, and I know some people plant their garlic on the, the shortest day of the year, so that's the 21st of December. And I know other people that plant their garlic in the autumn. So this year, I'm going to try planting in the autumn, I think. Um, December feels a little bit late although it still works fine so this book says one thing and this book's got like lots of really precise measurements about how far apart everything should be so it's just a rough guide and yeah you don't have to be too rigid about sticking to all these very precise um, measurements and depth soil depths and all that. There's a couple of questions come oh. in Robin I don't know if you want me to just um, there was one about the, the raspberries 
Um, yeah. Debbie's asking, do you, can you just stick the raspberry canes into the ground if you're planting some yourself? I love your raspberry jungle. I've always worked like that, but never had as many. Um, yeah, pretty much just stick them in. So you can buy canes or um, <laughs> you can, if you live in the area, you can um, get in contact with me and give me your contact details because I'm always pulling out raspberries that get into the wrong place. I had to sort of manage that a little bit because they were growing, they went like completely across the other side of the garden. And so when I pull them up, um, sometimes I give them to um, friends and neighbours. In fact, there's Juliana, she's got some of my raspberries growing in her garden. Um, so yeah, so if you want to leave me your contact details and you live locally, next time I pull up some raspberries, um, you can have them. So yeah, just just stick them in the ground. They're pretty robust. I don't see why they wouldn't grow. That's great. Um, there's a couple of other questions. Um, one relating to watering. If water's um, if they're in a grow bag, how often yeah. would you water them? Is that something? Is that you... the one for tomatoes? Yes, for tomatoes. Sorry. Yeah. So tomatoes are pretty hungry plants, and that's kind of obvious because they grow big juicy fruit so that means they use a lot of nutrients and a lot of water same as courgettes so I would just keep an eye on the soil and when it gets when it feels a little bit dry just water it yep and then there was another one um sorry I thought I wrote it down but I've, I've lost it now um about sweet potatoes have you grown sweet potatoes I haven't grown sweet potatoes but Juliana grows sweet potatoes I know so that can be done. So she's just down the hill. So it can be done up here. This year I planted Jerusalem artichokes for the very first time. So that feels quite exciting. So maybe next year I'll try uh, sweet potatoes because I noticed all the sweet potatoes in the supermarket here come from America. And it, that just doesn't make me feel very good. Not with their food standards. But we eat a lot of sweet potatoes here. So yeah, if you can grow your own and not eat imported sweet potatoes from America, I think that would be a very good thing. So um, Val, sorry, um, we, Robin's in, in Dorney, so it, she, she's she's in Loch Alsh, Conan Bridge Val is, she joined last week as well. Um, maybe once lockdown ends we will manage to get them, get them further afield as well. <laughs> Someone um, else is, yeah, you go ahead. Global so do you get um, plagues? Oh yes. Do you get plagues um, or inconvenient insects? And if so, what do you use? Well, yes. Nothing too crazy. Slugs, of course. I've tried different things for slugs. So in fact, someone was suggesting earlier you can put seaweed down, and then when it dries, they don't like it because it's all hard, so they can't crawl across it. Jake and Kate last week were saying about they just go out and pick them off and kill them. Um, I know some people use ducks, so I guess once your garden gets more established you could let ducks in and they just would suck the slugs up. I get something called, um, what's it called, something fly like a gooseberry fly, saw fly, that's it, saw fly, and I get that on my gooseberry bush every year and I read that you can put diatomaceous earth around the base of the gooseberry bush and that will um, <coughs> dry out the laver so I'm going to try that this year or the other thing is if they make it onto the bush I'm just going to pick them off sometimes that's just what you need to do is just get out there and pick them off you can't always just you know spray a magic potion at things and it solves it um, and then someone's asked if you can use conifer clippings as a mulch around blueberries um, you would need to check that research that online because I actually did that one year and then I thought I was going to put it around other plants and I thought I'd better just check about using bark from conifers and I think it is that it draws a lot of nitrogen from the soil and of course then it takes it away from the plants so you might be better off letting it break down for a couple of years but I would suggest researching that online. Um, Val's just asking if you could repeat the bit about the soft fly as well. Oh yeah, so there's, I've discovered there's quite a lot of soft flies that, that go on various, you get gooseberry soft fly, blueberry soft fly, rhubarb soft fly, I don't know, lots of different soft flies. And they have totally annihilated my gooseberry bush for the last couple of years. And I sort of 
well, before lockdown, I was really, really busy. So I would just blink and then spring had happened and my gooseberry bush was um, was without any leaves and there was just a, a couple of poor looking uh, berries on it. But this year I've got a lot more time. So I looked into what was what this pest was that was annihilating my gooseberry bush each year and found out that it was um, the soft fly for gooseberry bushes. Um, so this year I'm going to put diatomaceous earth, which is like a fossil um, soil thing um, that I use in the hens for warming them, for keeping away um, mites and lice. You can also use it in your garden and it will dry out any uh, lava, um, lava, sorry. So I'm going to try that. And then the other th thing I'm going to do is just like, if I see them, just literally pick them off and feed them to the hens. Um, so Val just commented on that one. Um, I'm presuming that this is what she's done in the past, is, is having to cut them back hard immediately. The bushes? Yeah, I'm, I'm presuming yeah, it's the bushes. Okay. She can maybe expand on that one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well that would just, that would get rid of them. And if you've you got don't. a lot of bushes, because we, my dad's got a whole load of, um, I don't think loganberry or some kind of berry bushes, and each year they get annihilated, but there's so many of them that you would have to do something like that. Like I've just got one gooseberry bush. So it's fine to pick them off, but if you've got a lot, that would be quite difficult. Um, someone said, my courgettes are now planted, but each one of them has gone has got a yellow leaf. Any ideas what, why this is happening? I plant courgettes every year and I've been doing it for years. I love courgettes. I always plant double what I think I would need just in case something goes wrong. And I've had the worst year for courgettes. I don't know what's going on. I grew some from seeds. They didn't grow very well. I bought two lots of um, Donald at Loch Duke plants. The last time he dropped them off, he said, oh, is this another courgette plant for you to kill? I don't know what's going on. Is it, is it just the weather, the temperature? I managed to get two growing quite well and then the rest are limping along. So I don't know what's going on. Um, I haven't read about, I read about leopard slugs. They just mulch old veg. I haven't checked this out though. I don't know anything about leopard slugs. Um, but I'll check that out. Can we transplant wild garlic to our garden? That's an interesting question. I've been thinking about this because there's wild garlic down the hill and I was wondering if I could transplant it to the right part of the garden. I don't see why not if you can plant it in a area that is similar to how where you find it they quite like sort of shady woodland areas. Um, oh yeah other people having problems with courgettes this year. I do know the one thing about courgettes is quite often you get the little baby courgette and then the end just rots off and that is because you have on one plant you have male and female components so the, the male is the lovely flower and the female is the baby plant and you need with the flower on the end and you need flies um, and bees to, to cross pollinate so if it rots at the end it means that it hasn't been fertilized um, I guess you could try using a small paintbrush as well how people the same way that people do with their uh, tomato plants um, so okay on the uh, yellow leaf of the courgettes, um, someone's come back to say yellow leaf can mean overwatering or, or underfeeding. Okay. So that's that's Val, who's one of our experienced okay. um, <laughs> contributors. <laughs> okay. And um, so the uh, Abriachan Nursery, which is on Loch Ness side, sells wild um, <laughs> sells wild garlic, and. Um, so might be worth trying to transplant. I quite fancy that myself. We will also be doing a foraging, um, another foraging workshop. So I might ask um, ask Verity on that one as well if they've ever tried that too. Okay. So kind of a slightly aside to that. Yeah. Okay, so lastly, I'm just going to talk a bit about planning. Um, I've certainly had a bit more time to plan this year than I have in previous years. Um, I don't know if you all know something about crop rotation but it is advisable to rotate. So if you've got beds, it's advisable to rotate what you plant in them every year. You don't want to plant the same thing in the same bed year after year. And that's just because um, if those particular plants have particular pests and that can build up in the soil. Um, it doesn't really matter how you rotate. 
I follow a rotation method from a book. So I'm, I do a bit of moon gardening, which is just where you plant by the um, the moon cycle. And it's not about planting at night or anything. And this suggests planting. So you would plant like your roots one year and then, no, what is it? I would, I've forgotten, but it's something like, say you've got your kale one year and then you do your roots the next year because they go deeper down. So they've got like a nice four year rotation plan. I can put that into the resources one next. So that's what I'm doing this year. And potatoes are always a good one to start with because they break up the soil really well. Um, and every year I draw a plan of my vegetable garden. I make a map. So something like this. So I just plan out um, my beds and what I'm going to plant in them. And because I've been doing it for the last four years, I make, I make a map every year. So it means that I always have a record of what I've planted. So when I'm sitting down to do this at the end of the year or at the beginning of the next year, I know which way my crop rotations are going. So it's quite handy to, to do that because it's amazing what you forget. You don't think you'll forget at the time, but then you do when you, when you come to do your next plan. Um, something, there's something called succession planting, and that is where you plant, say, carrots or lettuces every two weeks or every three weeks. Um, you might have noticed in my root beds that not everything was at the same growth rate, and that's because I planted things two weeks apart or sometimes three weeks apart, or maybe even one time a month. Um, and that just means that you've got carrots ready at different times of the year. So you're not getting like a massive carrot glut or a massive beetroot glut. Sorry, Robin, just to come back to the um, uh, diatomaceous earth that you were saying yeah. about. Um, um, Malcolm has Googled it and says it is safe to consume but not to inhale as it can cause inflammation and scarring to the lungs. So just That's take correct. care. Yes. <laughs> Good tip. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good idea to try and order your seeds early. Um, I'm, and I did that. I ordered my seeds at the end of last year. Strangely, it's not like me to be that organised, but I was really glad that I did because then when lockdown happened, everyone was trying to order seeds from the company that I use. And of course, they had they could have less staff working so they couldn't keep up with the demand so it is a good idea to plan ahead um, order your seeds plan where you're going to plant them work out what um what particular plants like in terms of fertilizer so that you can prepare the beds for those plants the coming spring um, and think about as well in winter there's always plenty of jobs you can be doing like um if, so last year I planted sage plants up here for the first time and they've been brought on in a nursery and they're not used to temperatures on halfway up a highland hill so I covered them with like a sort of fleece and some of them survived and one of them didn't but that's because I actually covered it straight I put like a half a barrel around it and then I put the fleece over the top and weighed it down with wood and that just created a cold damp area and most of it died whereas the other one I planted in a couple of tires then put two bits of wood up and draped the fleece over so there was a lot more air circulating and that one survived really well. So other things you can do in winter is keep on weeding, um, put manure down and compost down. It's a good idea to then put cardboard over the top that stops the weeds coming up um, and just lets it all break down really nicely and the worms really like that as well. When I lift the cardboard off the next year I always find it there's lots of worms and they've broken it and um, broken the soil down in a lovely way. Um, you can still plant and harvest in the winter um, and there is a nice magazine article that I found and um, Karen's got the link for it so we can share that later um, and it says winter is coming okay it's not here just yet but start planting now and you'll have a bounty of vegetables by the end of the year so I think that came out last sort of after summer last year so there talks about um, winter brassicas, carrots, leeks and spinach and Swiss chard and hardy salad leaves. Um, and also kale, I wanted to say about kale, don't pull up your kale um, at the end of the year or early the next year because it kind of grows for ages. So March tends to be a hunger gap when things, most things are not growing. Kale will always be there for you. 
because it for maybe like December, January, it goes dormant, not much happens, but then February, little leaves start to grow um, and you can also eat the flowers. So I would pull that up at the very, very end and maybe even leave a little bit extra just in case. Mm. And okay, lastly, I made a little video with some top tips, which might be nice to play that card. One of my top tips is using willow um, to make supports for netting. Um, in the past I've just left strawberries to grow but I've discovered two things, that the strawberries when they get heavy um, as they're ripening they fall down onto the soil so it's good to put straw down so they don't get covered in earth and the other thing is that um, birds also like strawberries so this year I'm going to put a net over them so I've Luckily, I've got lots of um, willow growing about the place, so I cut some um, branches, took off all the little leaves, and then made these little supports for the netting. Um, and obviously, they are—they've grown a couple of times. So I just run my hand over to take off any new leaves that grow through, and then quite soon, I'm going to lay netting over this to stop the birds eating. Another top tip is um, something called interplanting, and that is where you plant um, crops that would grow faster in between slower-growing crops, such as here I've planted marked out by these sticks because I just planted it by seed um, lettuces planted amongst um, these Brussels sprouts because I know that the Brussels sprouts are going to grow quite slowly and hopefully be ready for Christmas time um, but the lettuces are a summer crop and they're going to grow a lot quicker One of my favourite things in um, the garden is this bucket with these hole in the bottom. It's actually a bit broken now um, so I'm going to make a new one but I use it for washing my produce in. So if you've got like a big pile of dirty carrots you just stick them in the bucket and then take the bucket up to the burn or to a hose pipe or to um, a tap and you can completely submerge this in the burn let all the water run over it and then pull out and drain it and your carrots are clean. Well obviously you have to get a brush and scrub them. Um, not as easy as that. But yeah, it's just really, really handy because it's big and it's got holes at the bottom and it's made by, and um, obviously do this safely, is getting a poker and heating it up in the fire and then poking it through um, the end of the bucket. Okay. Um, Amanda's saying that she's on her fifth row of radish. She, pl she plants a row every week. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I interpla interplanted some radish this year in between, in my bean frame, so so the bean frame goes up like that and I planted a row of radishes down the middle um, because they grow, yeah, they grow so quickly so that I knew that the beans would, would not like um, grow as quick as them and then cloud, um, block out the, the earth. And I've also planted a little row down the edge of where I've got the potatoes planted. And uh, Val is saying she's still using her Cavalnero plants from last year. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's like kale as well. It lasts for ages and keeps on growing. This year, actually, I let the hens into my garden for the first time. Um, right at the beginning of the year, I thought, let's, in fact, it was Juliana told me that's what she does. She lets her hens into the garden to eat any little insects to prepare for the year ahead. So I thought, great, what a good idea. So I hen proofed it so that once they got used to going in and they shut the gate they wouldn't be able to get in because I, I had like um deer fence wire so I had to put like a smaller mesh over that so they can't couldn't squeeze through but they ate all the kale and so I don't know if I'm going to do that next year or I will need to um put netting over the kale so they can't get to that someone's saying I have an old wheelbarrow without a wheel who doesn't have one of them lying around um, and they were thinking about growing herbs in it. Do I need to make holes, um, holes in it drainage? Definitely. Otherwise it will get waterlogged. 
So you could just get a nail and a hammer. You might be able to hammer some holes through with a big thick nail or if you have a, a drill with a metal attachment um, or some, some other sharp implement. Lynn's been growing perpetual kale, grows brilliantly all year round. I've not heard of perpetual kale. Okay, that's interesting. Amanda's planted nasturtiums and marigolds um, that she's grown from seed to act as companion plants for carrots and cabbage. Yeah, great idea. So I've been doing a bit of that this year for the first time, um, planting a lot more flowers in my garden, exactly for companion planting. And if you don't know what that is, it's where you plant flowers besides particular crops that help those crops to grow, such as, um, is it marigolds? Oh, I can't remember which way around it is. Um, maybe it's that, nasturtiums and marigolds would detract or attract um, pests that might damage your carrots. And in fact, talking about companion planting, some vegetables just don't like each other. So last year I planted in the same raised bed I had as I had the strawberries and I put the Brussels sprouts. And apart from the fact that I planted them too late in the year, they just really didn't do anything. They weren't healthy at all. And then I just discovered that strawberries and um, Brussels sprouts just don't like each other. So I planted them, the Brussels sprouts in a different part of the garden this year and earlier, and they're growing much better. On the companion planting side of things, um, there was a small discussion last week about it. And in between then and now, um, I actually saw something on Facebook that um, the Viewfield Garden Collective, who are up in, in Portree, I think it is, they shared a while ago. Um, so I could, it's, it's just, a, it's on Facebook, but it's maybe something we can include. Um, and apart from the fact that you're companion planting to help your vegetables, you're also putting more um, flowers in your garden and helping the bees. It's just lovely seeing and hearing all the bees flying around. Okay. Not it's not that it's not come out that great. It's, it's quite small scale. Again, the thing with companion planting as well is that I have read different um, different things and different sources. In fact, this moon gardening book here has got a whole section on companion planting, um, which I've used quite a bit. Um, yeah, companion planting, and then it's got a nice grid there of what what goes and doesn't go with each other. So this is, I use this moon gardening book but I also use in fact Hattie who is my croft sitter she introduced me to this um, moon gardening book and what I love about this one is it comes with a great light calendar um, that tells you what you can plant each day so I found that really useful to follow. Um, I think lastly, Karen, could you please show the picture number 20, that's the straw bale. So I haven't done it yet, but I've, I've never planted mushrooms and that's something that I would like to try. Um, so, in fact, Hattie told me that you can plant mushrooms in straw bales when it gets a bit old. So at the beginning of the year, I stuck a straw bale down the bottom of the garden where it's quite damp and dark. I've got a, an area of trees just behind the raspberries and I've often thought what well, that's just um, you can't use that for anything and um, it's just kind of well apart from the fact that it's nature it's a, a sort of a useless area of the garden but then I realized actually I could grow mushrooms down there so I stuck this um, bale of straw there last um, at the beginning of spring and it's already like sprouting so at some point I'll look into mushrooms and hopefully grow some mushrooms in there. And I got that from um, Duncan Dunsey. He sells animal um, feed supplies down in Dorney. What, what's the, um, Sue's asking, what's the name of the last book with the planting chart in it? I'll hold it up again. Um, I'm pretty sure you can still buy this on Amazon, even though we're half, halfway through the year. Okay. Um, so that's it. I think that's me covered everything that I was going to to cover. So I hope that was useful for everybody.
Thank you very much, Robin. That was brilliant. Really, really interesting. And the videos are really good to actually see as well. Um, yeah. And talking, talking through how to do things, I think is really, really, really useful. Yeah, there's a few, few comments about saying how good the videos are too. So. Or don't forget, if you live in the area, um, feel free to get in touch if you want raspberry canes. And then when I do pull any up, I can let you know. Because sometimes, yeah, it's, it's, I do sometimes pull up quite a lot. And then if I, sometimes I just put them into the compost heap and I think, what a shame. I also pull up quite a lot of strawberry plants because um, they're always putting out runners. Do you know what varieties you have there of raspberries? I don't have a clue because <laughs> they were there when I moved back home. But they are, you normally get summer strawberries and autumn strawberries and they're summer strawberries, that's all I know. Yeah. Uh, sorry, summer raspberries, you get summer um, raspberries and autumn raspberries and they're summer ones. But of course, and when you were saying earlier about um, having information from books as to when you can plant things, yeah. Of course, our, our seasonality is not the same as everybody else's. That's right, yeah. And of course, you know, I mean, I, I have different growing conditions from you as I'm, I'm further to the, I'm further to the east of you with, um, you know, this area is really very kind in terms of its weather, but then I'm, I'm really exposed um, to the southwest, which you know, brings all sorts of uh, fun, but uh, we're certainly in a different situation from when I was uh, growing elsewhere. Uh, yes, I've added about five weeks onto every plan I've seen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, Living yeah, exactly. Yeah, just the, other add, good, the other good thing about that is that when you look at seed packets and you're running late in the year and you think, oh God, I haven't planted that yet. And then you look at the seed packet and you go, <laughs> well, I'm already up here. I've got another couple of weeks on that or another month. It's, it says you best to plant up until uh, March, but I'm fine still planting that in April. Yes, that's what I found. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, I've tried to grow beetroot for the first time this year and I'm not really used to growing um, much stuff up here anyway, but because of lockdown, we've, really been trying to grow as much as we can I'm right next to the lock and I have the north and the northwesterly winds to contend with um, but the beetroot um, it has hardly come through and I did a second sowing and there's not much of that come through either is Mine there hasn't. any beetroot and how long when did you how long ago did you sow oh um the first lot I oh I checked the date earlier on it was about mid-April when I put the first lot in yeah, okay. Um, so the first several years that I planted beetroot, I didn't have much luck either. And last year, um, it, it, it worked much better. And I'm not really sure why that is. Um, but interestingly, there is on that resource page, Karen, there is um, the third one from the bottom. So I use a lot, um, a woman called Alice Fowler, and she writes for The Guardian. And she's always got lots of little interesting articles going on and she did one about um, beetroot and talked about what kind of nutrients it needed in the soil so if we share that then you, might, you might find some answers in there but and actually what happened was I, um, I had a really successful year last year with beetroot but I was away when it was when it was sort of ready to be picked and blinking mice got in and ate almost every single one um, so I, that's never happened to me before in my seeing my produce. So yeah, if you just I, I have read that beetroot, beetroot tends to like a fairly poor soil, and this um, vegetable bed that I'm growing it on was put in especially for me to grow um, vegetables and and the lettuce and the chard and everything's doing really well. But I'm wondering if if the ground is too rich beetroot. Okay, it could it could be. The other so thing this, is, this article is down. sorry um saying they like free draining yeah. um mineral rich soils with a ph roughly neutral and they're fussy about the micronutrients particularly boron so that's um the seeds that you're planting um so i've had 
um, in last year and this year I planted, I think I planted two, two different varieties. So sometimes it's good to try different varieties. They just mm. grow better, some grow better than others in different years or in different soils. So I would yeah. just like, keep going with um, trying different kinds of beetroot and planting in, in different soils. Well, my son and I love beetroot, so we won't be giving up anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, yeah, because that, that's what I thought as well. I thought, I'll just try it again. It's never going to grow. It's going to be tiny, but actually they grew great. And then the mice just, so imagine that's your beetroot and then you've got the lovely oh. foliage coming out of the top and the mice just came in and, and ate right like that, right round, just left oh. in the winter. <laughs> don't don't oh, forget, yeah. it can also be a drainage thing. Um, so not everything can grow well in compost it can be too heavy so for things like carrots I, I, I actually grow carrots in containers and then I, I use bought in compost and sand and I, I use I use grit sand for, for some things as well but um, maybe actually making making what you're growing the beetroot in lighter with um, a, a bit of sand added it, um, mm. it can help with the drainage. So it's got to great drainage because it is a brand new raised bed and it's got lots of different layers and we've put a board and all sorts of things in it. Um, but yeah, maybe a bit of sand perhaps. I don't know. It's, I think it's going to be a bit of trial and error to see how it grows here. Yeah, exactly. Trial and error. And just talking about growing um, carrots, did you say well, you grow carrots in pots? Yes. Yeah. So on yeah. that note, there's a there's a um a YouTube site that I use quite a lot called Grow Veg. I just discovered this guy um on lockdown. Um and Karen, it's the one that's on the, the very top of your list. Um and I quite often go onto this YouTube channel and search carrots or peas or whatever it is I'm thinking about sowing or growing, and he always does very informative videos. And there's one that he's got on growing carrots from seed to harvest and he, he shows how you can grow carrots in pots or in the ground. Um, and he's also got lots of videos, things, they're called things like five tips for planting your vegetable garden or he's got tips for planting during lockdown. Um, and he's also just a really lovely cheery guy. I, I really enjoy watching him. Thank so you. Apart, apart from him, I mean, if you watch a video from him, then in your search suggestion thing on the side, you'll see lots of other videos come up. So there's a, a million videos you can watch on YouTube about how to plant different crops or how to um, make different kinds of frames to support your beans and peas. I grow, I grow basically everything in pots or raised beds, though, because of disabilities. Um, I certainly can't get down to ground level anymore, and I, I can't I can't dig heavy stuff. Um, so actually, as I've had to do a lot of work in in terms of um, getting beds prepared that I can I can grow in. So I do I do grow in containers wherever possible. So it's always good to get feedback on um, on you know other people that are, are doing similar. Uh, you know, it's lovely looking. At your site there, Robin. You know that's that's really lovely. Um, but um, as I say, for me, I've I've had to have various raised beds around the place, and I'm I'm still trying to get more done. So, do you yeah. use a lot of fertilizer then? In your, with um, your yes, I use I I use some, but I I, I do a lot of um, um I I've got five compost bins around the place. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm producing quite a, a lot there um, and I've I the compost that I normally buy in is a New Horizon one which is prepped for um, for veg and fruit and you know so that will have some fertilizer in um, but usually it's just grow more mm -hmm. if I add anything um, I have um, I have taken advantage of a couple of offers from, I think it was Grow Your Own magazine. So I've got strawberry fertilizer and tomato fertilizer this year for actually adding, the tomato fertilizer is one for adding to the compost rather than just the tomato feed for when it's flowering and um, beginning to fruit. Um, so I'm, I'm trying that for the first time. Um, 
so yeah let's see let's see how we do i mean it's uh, it's it's been it's been good it's worked well so far here okay great and uh, talking about fertilizer um so just you can just search online how to make comfrey fertilizer or nettle fertilizer yeah. the ones from chicken manure or seaweed and that's what I did but well first of all someone told me how to do the comfrey and the nettle one well someone told me how to do the comfrey one then I read about the nettle one and then I searched online for the seaweed and the hen manure ones um, and I found different methods so I just kind of read a couple of each one and then decided decided which method I would like to to use myself or what one felt the most practical for me to do. I should have added I also get um, a supply of um, of juice from a friend's wormery that she's oh, okay. and then I dilute more so I'm using that this year um, yeah. so it's that that one that and one small box of grow more so we'll see how we do one I do you grow much in um, in a greenhouse at all Robin I don't have a greenhouse no I've no. just got that cold frame and that's where I start off so I start seedlings um, in the cold frame or inside on the windowsill. I'm I'm trying different things this year, you know, mostly partly being challenged over the um, over the plastic side, and also just the the whole thing of trying to live sustainably. I am trying a wider range of things. One thing I'm trying to grow this year, um, but I haven't a clue yet, um, is chickpeas. Oh wow! Which apparently you can grow up here. Okay. Um, that's but, exciting. Um, apparently they grow better in um in greenhouses so i shall i shall give it a go goodness that's exciting yeah it is i'm I'm really excited about that one um but i've had to i've had to get in a lot of plants i'd started growing lots of seeds but what i hadn't allowed for um i have a i, I got a kitten last year was actually any anything growing in the house oh yeah to be kitten proof and he loves um he loves chewing plants so and a lot of people have problems with um local cats in their garden um my mum's got all sorts of weird bits of wire and contraptions over her beds to stop the cats and we've got a cat up here too and she's I don't think she can get into the garden now that I've chicken proofed it which is great because one year I had my lovely root bed had like just went into a big disarray because she'd used it to go to the toilet in and everything just grew all in weird places not on those nice like straight lines that I planted them in. Yes <laughs> that's the other thing but my my older cat doesn't touch doesn't touch the plants in the same way but it, um, I, there was me thinking that actually having a Having a shower room with um, underflow heating will be a great place for uh, growing, um, growing my seed things. Um, you know, just keep um, keep a reasonable amount of light in there as as well. And I thought that would be great until he came in and devastated them. Oh, someone saying um, Emma Jane saying that she keeps an orange beside all house plants so that keeps the away. Okay. Ah. Wow. I'll try that. Oh great, and Amanda's saying she's going to collect seaweed from the shore and that a friend has offered a comfrey bush. Great. Well that's, yeah, if anyone else wants some um, comfrey and you live locally, um, give me a shout because I can easily take, dig a little bit out of my yes. patch there. I will come after lockdown if you please. Yeah. Sun is shining so let's get out into our gardens. Yeah, it's just roasting in I my office to, um, here at the back of the house. So. Yeah, I need to rake up the soil around my potatoes and um, I'm only halfway through that so I'm going to go and do that just now and probably make a nice cold drink and take it and sit in the garden and just enjoy the space. Thank you very and much. And someone's just saying about recording these. We are recording them, I just haven't got around to editing them. I'll perhaps have to ask Robin for some tips I think. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Robin. That was that was great. And thank you everyone for joining and um, the questions and everything. And yeah, keep an eye out for, for more coming up as well. Okay, yeah. thanks very much, everyone. Bye -bye. Enjoy your gardening. Bye. Bye